Thank you. I'm going to talk about what money is. It might seem like an obvious thing. We use money all the time. We wouldn't live without money. But there are certain social, cultural, legal aspects to money that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and obviously, I'm going to talk about how digital assets or crypto fits into this broader framework. Imagine, imagine I was in a desert island, and you were unlucky enough to be there with me. A few of you in the audience know me well. The glare of these lights means I can't really see you, but there are a couple of you in the audience who know me very well. Now, if you were on the desert island with me and you were a friend or family, would we need money? No. If there was two, three, five of us, even 10 of us, and we were best friends, we wouldn't have money. We'd need language. We'd need language to communicate, but we wouldn't need money. We'd be using gifting. I do something for you. I don't know, I, I fish. Then I cook the fish for you, and in return, you'll do something for me. We'll trade IOUs or favors. As society gets bigger, instead of 10 best friends on this desert island, we have 100 people on the desert. Like, if all of you were on the desert island with me, what would happen? We'd have a trust problem. We wouldn't know each other. We'd need some form of money. <clears throat> We'd probably use, depending on what we were used to in that society, beads or shells, rice even. Japan used to use rice as a means of currency a thousand years ago when the state was weak. We'd use something like that as a form of currency. And then we go on to coins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if you go to the extreme, for you, right-hand side of the presentation, you'll see a few buzzwords, AI, blockchain, extended reality. That's what we used to call the metaverse, but I prefer calling it X-reality. That's the world of augmented reality and AI coming together. So this is a very basic version of that. These are my meta smart glasses. But in that world, money is going to look different. Money is going to be multi-format. It's going to be kaleidoscopic. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next 10 minutes or so. But first, let's define money. What, what is money? So money has a social and anthropological definition. My desert island point. But money also has a legal definition. The reason the Hong Kong dollar is money in Hong Kong is because it's legal tender. If you're a merchant, you have to accept it. The taxi I just took from Central, the taxi driver had to accept my Hong Kong dollar. It's the law. I could have taken out my UAE dirham. I'm based in Dubai. I could have given him a dirham note. He doesn't have to accept it. It's money back in the UAE where I live. It's not money here. So money actually has a legal definition. It's the liability of a central bank. But most money in an economy isn't central bank money. Today in the US, about 75% of money is commercial bank money. Stable coins and crypto assets have money-like features. One aspect of money is the ability to exchange. I can do payments with money. And obviously, stable coins and some, not all, crypto assets are a good means of exchange. But most crypto assets are not good means of exchange. They're not legal tender. They're not money. They are money-like. Now, this doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. It has value as a financial asset, in my view. Do you know that roughly 10% of the world's gold sits in India? Yeah. It doesn't sit in Fort Knox. It's not sitting in the Reserve Bank of India. About 10% of gold is sitting in India. Most of it held by Indian women. So all, you, all my crypto friends who talk about self-custody, Indian women have been doing this for generations, for centuries. Why is, why is gold in so many cultures such an intrinsic part of society, culture? 
it's got inter intergenerational value. You can self-custody it. Where institutions are not trusted, where institutions are weak, this has value. It also allows you privacy. And conceptually, I think one of the big positives of Bitcoin and certain other cryptocurrencies is that we get privacy. And we have an innate right, I believe, to privacy. And how do we do privacy in a digital world? You do it through cryptocurrencies. Now, this isn't a plea to policymakers to say we have to abandon all AML rules, all sanctions rules, but I believe there's an innate right to privacy. Other people don't need to know what we're doing, and crypto fills that hole. Now, having started with that kind of cypherpunk philosophy, I find it somewhat ironic that in recent years, the narrative in the cryptocurrency industry has shifted to the institutions are coming. I work for one of these institutions. I work for one of the largest, most international banks in the world. I run a think tank for Citi called Future of Finance. <clears throat> parts of our bank trade crypto. Parts of our bank will hold crypto. Other parts of our bank loathe and disdain crypto. But what's interesting is the role of particularly US-based institutions on the investor side in the last couple of years. And you can see that in the correlation. The, not the short term, not the one day correlation or the one hour correlation, but when you take correlations on a rolling basis, on a monthly basis, you've seen a significant increase in correlation of Bitcoin returns and um, major US indices, stock market indices, because the holders are beginning to get more and more converged. We've seen an explosion, of course, as all of you know, in the number of coins. We now have, I don't know how many it is. When I did the deck, it was a couple of million coins. Um, it's probably more now. I think of the, for me, the mental framework of the analogy for this is railways. I don't know if anyone studied or looked at the history of railways when the railways began in the 1830s. If you invested in a railway company in the 1830s in England or the 1840s, you'd have lost most of your money. Most railway companies went bust but they built something very valuable. They built an infrastructure, first in England, then in France and Belgium and Argentina and the rest of the world. And that's the mental framework of the model I use. Most of those two million coins are gonna to go to zero, but some of them are gonna become very valuable. So caveat emptor, buyer beware. Carrying on that kind of transport analogy, railways, railways appear 1830s, as I said, most of them go bust. But by the 1930s, the 1950s, in most countries in Europe and then in Asia, they become a staple part of infrastructure, of moving people. And for me, railways, similarity with blockchain. Now, the roads that existed in the 1830s when railways come about, they were pretty bad, right? What were the roads built for in the 1830s? Horses, carriages. That's what the roads were built for in the 1830s. And over time, the roads get better. 100 years later in Germany, we get the autobahns. 120 years later, we get interstate highways in the US. I see the fiat system continuing to improve under the competition and threat of new technologies coming along like blockchain. So we don't have real-time payments cross-border. We have it domestically in 70 plus countries now. But cross-border, you're beginning to see the vast majority of payments now by volume clearing in an hour. Three, five years ago, it would have been typically several hours. 10 years ago, it would have been several days. So for me, the fiat system is like the roads. Those roads used to be literally in the 1830s to 70s covered in what? Manure. Because there was horses and carriages. The roads got significantly better as the railways. Can and then we had trams. And there are lots of ways of getting around. If you're in Hong Kong, um, most cities in Asia, there are lots of ways of getting around. That's the kind of mental framework I have for how money is going to look in the future. There's going to be lots of ways of getting around. Now, one of the biggest shifts that we've seen 
in the kind of institutions are coming narrative is tokenization of financial assets. This takes time because you have to rewire all the existing plumbing of FMI, the existing financial market infrastructure. So it always takes longer than you expect. It's not just the variable cost or the variable transaction benefit that matters. It's about integrating it into the whole existing stack. And that technical, legal, cultural integration takes a long, long time. But what you have now for the first time in the last 15 years is some of the largest asset managers, investors, some of our biggest clients saying, we want to do tokenization. And this is, this is a huge, huge positive development if you're interested in blockchain in the last couple of years. Now, ironically, and this is going to be a short-term or a medium-term forecast that I'm going to make, um, ironically, this institution's getting interested in tokenization is in the next three, five, seven years going to lead to a re-entrenchment of the US dollar. And it's going to be one of the ironies of a movement that began with cypherpunks, a movement that began with kill the dollar or kill the banks. Crypto and blockchain is actually going to reinforce the dollar. Why? Because most of the assets going to be tokenized are dollar-based assets. They're not euro assets. They're not RMB assets. They're not Aussie dollar assets. They're US dollar assets. The vast majority of money market funds, VC funds, PE funds that are being tokenized are US dollar assets. So it's one of those ironies. We're going to go in a circle. We're going to have emerging technology actually reinforce the role of the dollar, not undermine the role of the dollar. And that's, if I'm wrong on that, hit me up in the next five to seven years and say, Ronit, I saw you on stage in Hong Kong at the Kerry Hotel. That was a horrible forecast. But uh, the dollar is actually going to get reinforced and strengthened. Now, all of these thoughts, comments, are publicly available. Sorry for the plug. Um, you can put into Google um, search engine of your choice, um, City GPS, and look into these reports. You can also, if you're interested in some of my thoughts, look at a book called Future Money, which I've just put out um, earlier this year, available in Hong Kong and around the world. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today.